We are now approaching the centenary of one of the most fateful days in modern Irish history, the 21st of November 1920, Bloody Sunday. On that date, Michael Collins instructed his IRA volunteers to kill at 9am that morning 14 British Secret Service agents who had recently come to Dublin, whom Collins believed had been sent to Dublin to assassinate him. What would the British response be? Reprisals were commonplace at the time, often denied at Westminster but also condoned privately. That same day, Pather Clancy and Richard McKee, organisers of Collins' squad, were killed by the British. That they were prisoners in Dublin Castle at the time did not detract from the controversies surrounding their deaths. McKee and Clancy Barracks are named after them. British troops then went to Croke Park, where Dublin and Tipperary were playing a friendly match. They opened fire on the crowd and on the pitch, and 12 were killed. Some 10,000 people were estimated to have been in Croke Park that day. In the RTE Sound Archives, there is direct testimony from four who recalled the occasion. Although interviewed some decades later, the events of that day were etched in their memories. Two of them, players on the Tipperary team, Colonel Tom Ryan and Bill Ryan. Also two Dublin schoolboys. One was as young as five, lived near Croke Park and was drawn along by the crowd. The original interviews were recorded by Donoco Dooling, McDonne, P.P. O'Reilly, Colm Keane. I have edited their testimony so that listeners can follow their eyewitness accounts as they tell the unfolding story of that Sunday, cross-cutting the testimony as events proceed. The two Dublin voices are the voices of the then boys. The two Tipperary voices are those of the two players on the Tipperary team. The players are Bill Ryan and Colonel Tom Ryan, who was beside Michael Hogan when he was shot dead. Some few years later, the Hogan stand was named in his honour. And the two Dublin boys were Michael Francis Coogan, then only five years old, and Mick Leahy, later a Dublin GAA official. I remember well getting ready to go to Grove Park. We had been up in the park and we went to myself and my brother. On the way down, we used to walk down, down the North Circle Road, and on the way down at the Doyle's Corner, my father was just getting off morning duty and he saw us going down and he was going to stop us going down but the, the conductor who was with him and he said I'll let them go down and that there'll be no trouble on it. They were after hearing about the trouble in the city that morning you know. So off we went and we went down and as usual we went into Crow Park. Used, that time used to go in the canal end. These Crosley tenders swept round the corner and these fellas, these soldiers, black and hands, stood up in them and with their rifle butts they smashed them into the faces of the girls standing beside me and the people. Uh, there was nothing only screaming and blood playing around. Some of the blood hopped on my white shirt that I was wearing. So I became panic stricken and the crowds started to rush backwards and forwards, meeting each other, crowds that was coming down with Skip Street to match, and crowds running back. The next thing happened, I think it was auxiliaries that came in the canal gate, and they fired three shots in succession. I saw all the crowd rushing around at the canal end. So, there was a lot of people who wanted to see what was going on, despite the rifle cracks and all that type of thing. And so, some of the vehicles had been pulled up, and they were standing up and firing right across the bridge. And the next thing I saw, Mick Hogan and a Dublin player come and run in my direction. So I turned and ran down the field the same way. A Dublin player was running in front of me and I followed him. And he crossed the wires now about the end of the Cusick stand. He crossed over the plane pitch and I followed him out of the plane pitch. And I, I thought that up to that time that it was blanks that were fired. And the match was on about ten minutes when we heard these bangs. But at that time, you think they were slap bangs, you know, we didn't know what it was until after a while we noticed everyone running towards the gates and shouting and screaming. There was no wall around Crow Park. Yeah. It was a galvanised hoarding yeah. of about, we say about eight feet higher. We rushed down the hill. You had to slide down the hill, down the back, you know, there was no, no steps, steps or anything. We slide down and everyone, but everyone was trying to get to the gates out and they were full and but... We got to this galvanise and some men there lifted us up and pushed us on the top. We had to jump down over. The first, the first thing that struck us, we, those of us who had volunteer training, was to lay prone on the ground and following that, uh, a voice, a consolation voice, shouted out, they're firing blanks. A minute later, 
it was obvious they weren't firing blanks. Sparks started flying out of the railway wall and uh, people started to roll down from the embankments and it was obvious that people were getting shot. We lay still prone and the backs, our backs and the forwards, the Dublin forwards, rushed away, fr rushed away from the firing end, from the canal end of it, and they rushed toward the railway exit. As the firing continued, the, both the Dublin and teams decided to leave in pairs, left automatically in pairs, uh, two pairs left, Hogan was in the top pair that got up to go, and as he did, he fell forward. I was within about three yards of him at the time, lay in the centre of the field, when, as he fell forward and fell to the ground, I saw the blood gushing from through his jersey, and he spurted, spurted up. I knew that he was shot and slipped across towards him and, and, and heard the words, Jesus, Mary and Joseph, from his lips, and I decided to rush for my life and try and get out. But I could hear the bullets whizzing. I thought they were hitting off of the waiters. But when I got over, the, got out of the plane pitch, I had the, the Dublin player lost. He was gone away. I don't know which direction he went. But I crossed over, over where you call Hill 16 now. And at that time, it was corrug corrugated iron. The galvanized, as we call it, was the outer wall. And when, when I got to that far, it was flattened out. The crowd had knocked it to the ground. So... Just when I crossed over this fence, I was held up with the sword, the military, brought back in again, behind, partly behind the railway goal. I was there for what I thought was two hours, but I suppose it wasn't, <laughs> with your hands over your head. Did they rough you up? Well, no. No, they were, the military were, no, we couldn't say anything to them. They were very fair, no, the military. These yeah. weren't black and tans, no? Oh, no, they were the, the soldier military. So we were held for a long time there. You were searched and playing through as men were up and down, you know, and they, they were interviewing, they were there, everybody, but they'd go to certain lads that they thought they knew and question them and all that. But they never one of them came near me. So eventually this this army officer came along and he came up along, he was viewing the crowd too and when he came up just to where I was, he came across to me and I thought I was followed. But he, he said to me, how long, how long were you playing? I told him about 10 or 12 minutes. And he said, who was winning? I told him there was no score. And he said, did you expect to win? And I said, we did. <laughs> this was in the middle of all the fuss now, yeah? Yes. But of course, there was a lot of lads let go at this time. Mm. I was searched, but I was still held there. As I, as I swept down then with them, I saw people falling and I saw one man being stood up against the railings that was over the bridge and I saw this man putting a rifle up to him and taking out uh, his watch from his waistcoat. Now, whether he was shot or whatever happened to him after, I don't know, but the next thing was I heard loud cracking of a whip and shouting and roaring and people falling left, right and centre and the, the, there was people jumping into the canal over the, over the low wall that surrounded Crow Park at the time. They were jumping down onto the railway, they were running up then towards Bins Bridge or down towards Ballybuck Bridge and some of them were jumping into the water and the town still kept firing down at them. When they, all the screeching all started, we were, we were shouted at to get out as quick as possible, you know, as quickly as possible, and that. But when we got out over and onto the ground, myself and my brother, the first house, the doors were open and the people were all being pushed in there, like, or called in there, if you like, you know. So we went into that room and it was chock full into that house, mm. chock full. There were women and men and there was one player. One player was there and in his togs and that, and who which, afterwards which turned out when Sean, Sean seen it. Sean seen it. The rosary, somebody started saying the rosary. Heard that there was someone killed or shot and that, and we started saying the rosary. And uh, it wasn't long until there were two big bangs on the door and in come two soldiers. One, I think, was an auxiliary and the other was a soldier and that. And, uh, like, they were talking to the woman of the house and that, and she was explaining, I suppose, about everything. But uh, they went out anyway, and the rosy prayers continued, and they came back after a few minutes, and they said that uh, they take out John Sinnott first. He went out first, and uh, they handed him over to somebody. And came back again immediately and said, the women and children. So we were next out. Gotcha. 
Bill Ryan, Tom Ryan, both Tipperary hurlers, and Michael Francis Coogan and Mick Leahy, recalling Bloody Sunday. And the aftermath, what happened at the conclusion of that day, will be included next Sunday, including how the British officer, who had got into small talk about the match, later intervened on Bill Ryan's behalf and ordered British troops to release that man. He's all right. You can hear that anecdote next Sunday. A postscript to our archival feature last Sunday on Bloody Sunday at Croke Park in November 1920. So uh, uh, we went up and we went to the top of uh, James's Avenue, we were searched. Well-known Dublin GA official Mick Leahy recalling how as a schoolboy he had gone to Croke Park that day with his brother. And we were told that uh, we could go. Well, my brother, it was like going to confession. There were two rows, two soldiers searching, you know. He was on the left, I was on the right. Well, he took the left. He came home by the North Circle Road and I went by Ballybock and he got home first and said I was lost. And, of course, my people were anxious, you know. And some years later, he got an opportunity to find out what had happened to John Sinnott, Dublin footballer, whom he'd seen being taken away by the soldiers after the match. But mind you, a few years afterwards, I was anxious to know about John Sinnott, what happened to him. He was taken out first, and John told me, he was at a dinner on Rose had, and he was sitting beside me, and we spoke about it and that, and it was a coincidence, you know. And uh, John told me that he was walked down Clonliff Road, along Ballybock Road, and when you got around Ballybock, the, the red bridge there, you know, the red yes. bridge there, and uh, he was just at that red bridge when, and Clonliffe Avenue is on the right, some soldier whistled the soldier that was with him, and the soldier told him to run. The soldier, uh, John said afterwards that he thought that the soldier who whistled had come across something. Yeah. You know, so he told John to go run. It could be dangerous to run in such circumstances, since shot while attempting to escape was all too often a coroner's verdict. Before John came out of the house, some lady gave him a coat to put over him, you know, so he hadn't got it when he was going away, but he ran anyway, and he was expecting a bullet every minute in his back, but no, he got round the corner and got home to 62 Lower Sheriff Street where he lived. Another of those whom you heard last Sunday, footballer Bill Ryan of the Tipperary team, told us how a British officer had spoken to him at some length while he was awaiting questions by the interrogating troops on the field. This officer engaged in small talk about the match, for how long had they been playing before the army raided, who was winning. Now, it should be remembered that the Tipperary team seemed to have been of special interest to the army interrogators. They were looking in all the commotion for individual players in the Tipperary colours. Getting an overcoat, somehow a disguise was an important help to the Tipperary players in escaping from Croke Park. Bill Ryan, to his surprise, found himself being helped in the escape by this British officer. But eventually, anyway, he said there was a spectator beside me and he made him take up the overcoat and give it to me. So he told me to go and then. I left and I went back over to Old Hill 16 and got I was held up with the military again and brought back in. They said to me, we'll have to another word with you. So, just as we arrived back, this officer was still there and he, he said, let that chap go, he's all right. So I went quick the next time. One of the less well-known dimensions to Bloody Sunday that day. Finally, this from Michael Francis Coogan, who, as I told you last week, was a boy of five on the day, lived locally and was swept along by the crowd. That is what I remembered of Bloody Sunday. And I read something, I heard there about it, and I said, well... I said, I was a living witness of it. And, you know, children, uh, as I know, are very uh, impressionable. And it made an awful impression on me that for years afterwards, I hated the sight of a uniform. And original interviews for those recollections of Bloody Sunday were by Donoghue Dooling, P.P. O'Reilly and Mick Dunn. <laughs>